Hello everyone. It is time for the second part of How to Social Science 101. I'm Christy Winters and in the last lecture we looked at the way that philosophically social scientists can think about the material world and the social world in terms of what exists, our ontology, and how we can know about what exists, epistemology. In this next section, I'm going to do a breathless review of history. I think that what I've called it is um, like a, a breathless run through history with lots of bits left out is what it ends up being called. Yeah, an insanely short history of the philosophy of social science with lots of bits left out. The goal here is to show people that what is cons what has constituted knowledge has changed over time and what that means is that the production of knowledge, science, is a social process and the facts that we produce out of this process are also social constructs. Yes, facts are socially constructed based on what people have decided are the basic criteria that things need to meet in order to be called a fact. Now, the let me differentiate a little bit in terms of what I see the difference between truth and a fact is. And a truth here, I'm talking about like capital T truth. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true in part because it's a tautology. Both sides of the equation match. 2 plus 2 is just another way of saying 4. And 4 can be expressed by 2 plus 2. So the left and the right side of the equation balance because it's basically saying the same thing. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a true statement. But in terms of facts, how many planets are there in the solar system? Is it eight? Is it nine? Is Pluto a planet? That information has changed based on what information we have as human beings. And facts can change. So for me, the evidence of a fact being socially constructed is that it is capable of being changed in light of new information. Whereas a truth, a capital T truth, cannot. Now that's a quick and easy division and you might have disagreements on subtle points. That's fine. But that was the basic idea I wanted to get about um, across in terms of why facts are socially constructed and how that is different from truth claims, at least in terms of things that are empirically true, independent of our knowledge of them. Now, in this lecture, what I want to do is just highlight the ways in which human beings have come to think about knowledge over time that change of what is considered valid knowledge over time and where we are. Again, the point of this is to get people thinking about the way the social world can be investigated separate from the physical world, but also just generally how do we approach our understanding of what it means to cite a fact, how do we generate facts, how do we determine what is a fact. And all of that is done by human beings in a social process of one sort or another. So getting on to the insanely short history of philosophy of science and social science and social science. Before the Greeks, and that I'm dating to um, Herodotus, most attempts to explain things in the world by people at that time were based in myth. Some sort of supernatural event was a causal, you know, contributor to, let's say, a thunderstorm. You know, the gods are shaking the volcano and that's why smoke is coming out. But with the Greeks, something incredibly important happened in human history. And I want to point this out because it, it really is a major step forward in terms of the production of knowledge. And that is that Greeks started to look at the natural world to try to understand the natural world rather than appealing to myths or traditions or supernatural explanations. They used the world to explain itself. And this was a massive, massive shift in how people were thinking. And the knock-on effect is actually still with us. You know, the everything that's followed, the, the reason that we're not still believing in myths is because of Greek culture and civilization getting these ideas, valuing them, and passing them along. Aristotle, a very famous Greek philosopher, um, and natural philosophy, or they also called it the philosophy of nature, was the objective study of nature and the physical universe before the development of modern science. So Aristotle is obviously connected with this. Now natural philosophy uses analysis and synthesis of common experience and argumentation in attempting to explain or describe nature.
Natural philosophy is different from modern science because it wasn't guided by the scientific method and it didn't use experiments to acquire knowledge. Aristotle was a very profound thinker in the history of, of human understanding and he got some things right, but he also got some things wrong. For instance, he claimed that human males have more teeth than human females and all he had to do was count <laughs> to realize he was wrong, but he didn't. He also thought an object with more mass will fall faster than an object with less mass, and that the Earth was the center of the universe. In summary, Aristotle went too far in deriving laws of the universe from just simple observations and overstretching what seemed like reason. You know, oh, it seemed very reasonable to conclude that men have more teeth than women because their heads are bigger. Well, it might seem reasonable, but maybe you should go count. So that was a, a massive, a big contribution, and uh, the next kind of big wave of philosophy that I'm at this point sort of like a, was using Bertrand Russell's History of Western Philosophy. There was a lot of stuff that happened in the next big um, burst, shall we say, that got us on the path of the scientific method was between 1100 and 1500 during the time of the scholastics. Now the scholastics themselves weren't really interested in natural philosophy. They were more interested in reconciling the uh, classical philosophers with medieval Christian theology and but it was important because the ideas of Aristotle and Plato were used and studied by the scholastics when they were making their arguments and that meant that these approaches filtered into an entirely new generation of thinkers and those people were um, then in this time period even though scholasticism was dominating in theology, the contributions of Aristotle and Plato into the mental like, perspective of people at the time had a, an impact. So we can see that um, in Roger Bacon in the early, in the 13th century, described a method of using a cycle of observation, hypothesis, experimentation, and then independent verification. He recorded how he conducted his experiments in detail so others could reproduce them and independently test his results. You can definitely see the, um, the basis of the scientific method laid out right there in the 13th century. Copernicus demonstrated the motion of the planets can be explained without assuming the Earth is centrally located and stationary. And Galileo demonstrated that objects, regardless of mass, fall at a constant rate. Kepler demonstrated that Mars' orbit would precisely fit an ellipse. And what we're seeing here is this approach of using the natural world to explain the natural world rather than attributing everything to God and miracles and magic. And this approach created the basis, again, building on the Greeks, it's the next step of getting us to what would become the scientific revolution. A change was happening in what people thought produced valid knowledge. And again, this is important. We're talking about the, the ways that, well, first elites, because this is where it happens normally, is within um, the institutions of higher learning or where knowledge is preserved. So this is obviously exclusively male domains because women were excluded from them. But within these domains, people were beginning to think in a different way about how we come to knowledge. Locke is also, you know, is known as the founder of British empiricism, and he rejected the idea of um, that God endows people with innate ideas that had been a staple of medieval thought. Instead, he proposed that people are born as a blank slate, and all knowledge is derived from our sensory perception and our experience. These ideas were built on by Hume, also an empiricist, and there's a lot of contributions that Hume has made. The one that I want to pick up on here, in particular when dealing with investigation of the social world, is his fact-value distinction. Because I think we can get at, and we've been, you know, use empirical information to understand people's values, and we can use empirical investigation to understand the facts of the matter. But our normative analysis is has makes different claims on a different grounding than our empirical analysis. Hume outlined, outlined two types of knowledge, one based on facts, the other on values. Empirical knowledge, or facts, is knowledge of the observable world based upon our sensory perceptions. 
Normative knowledge is based on values and beliefs informed by individual preferences. Because it is subjective, Hume asserted it can provide no basis for science, as we can say nothing certain about this type of knowledge. Let's take the issue of female genital mutilation. There isn't a, an independent fact in the world that one could find in order to conclusively disprove the cultural value of female genital mutilation. I strongly oppose FGM, and I think that there are many good normative values that can be cited in undermining the practices and the cultural norms about women that underpin the practice of female genital mutilation. And I think you can use facts about the health impact, about the psychological damage, the other things that happen to the woman or the girls, shall we say, who undergo this horrible procedure in order to make a case as to why it can be, why it should be eliminated, why it should no longer be practiced. However, in that, I try to make a factual claim on one part here, over here. These are the health reasons, these are the other reasons that we can see a negative impact. And then using those independent facts, make a normative case appealing to things like human rights and human dignity and bodily autonomy. So I think, you know, the, the important thing that I wanted to get across in the slide is that as a social researcher, you might have a normative position. There might be something that you want to see improved in the world, whether it's the process of child adoption or whether it's women's status in, um, you know, in particular countries. It's fine to have those normative positions, but as you're doing your research, it's very important to disambiguate your factual assertions from your normative assertions. And it's absolutely fine to cite facts when making a normative argument, but you can't use facts as if the facts themselves were normative, as if citing a fact therefore produces you with a justification for your normative conclusion. That's really what I wanted to pull out here. So that's a little bit more of an explanation of that slide, and now moving back on to the main lecture. So these ideas are intuitively plausible when discussing the physical world, but what about the social world? Two researchers that are very important to the development of the study of the social. The first is Auguste Comte, founder of modern sociology, and he introduced the term positive perception for knowledge that was acceptable for science. In other words, knowledge that we could be positive or certain about. So positivism isn't like being cheerful. It's about certainty, not about your emotional disposition. And he coined the term sociology for the science which would synthesize all positive knowledge about society. The study of human beings and human, human behavior you know, does go back to the Greeks. But the idea of studying people scientifically, or how do we understand the social world in the same, with the same sort of precision and rigor that people were making advances of in the physical world with electricity and pressure and gases, there were some really exciting things going on with, by using the scientific method on the physical world, on the natural world. And people were interested in, in investigating whether these tools could be used to understand humans and human behavior. And that's what the first sort of uh, comportment of source sociology toward the study of the social was. It was informed by the physical sciences. Now Durkheim agreed with Comte that society was part of nature. And the study of the social should use the same principles as in the natural sciences in order to find out social facts. Now, these social facts are things that are independent of individuals and constrain individuals. Social facts are socially constructed and collectively maintained, things like norms, laws, and customs. And sociology starts, in this perspective, starts with sense perception. But social facts are, of course, more difficult to observe than natural facts because they deal with concepts like freedom and democracy or racism. And those concepts exist in the minds of people. And that is what makes it difficult to get at with mere sensor, sensory perceptions. Durkheim's advice is that this requires us to use precision and clarity in our use of language. When we're studying, in this case, a social world which is highly dependent upon a concept being shared by people and understood, then precision and quality in our definitions 
is vital to making sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Now, his distinction between the natural sciences and the social sciences would be used by people employing a constructivist as opposed to a positivist approach to studying the social world. And a fundamental question that you can think about is, are methods and ideals used in the natural sciences really appropriate to the study of the social, of social phenomenon? Is the way that we go about examining how an atom behaves or the internal mechanics of how atoms function, is that really the best way to understand how human beings ascribe meaning to their government or ascribe meaning to their relationships or ascribe meaning to a belief in God? Is, the, is getting at the internal structure of atoms the best way to get at those beliefs that people hold. That's the challenge of social science. Positivism, which became uh, very influential in the 20th century, took a very hardline stance when it came to the use of methods that produce valid knowledge. It asserts this sort of perspective is, um, I don't want to say always associated with, but some of the positivist claims at this time were things such as only scientific knowledge is authentic knowledge. And scientific knowledge only comes through the use of a strict scientific method approach. Positivism in the social sciences is associated with quantitative methodology and quantitative methods. And just to get a little bit more of, on the background, the very influential thinkers of, of this were members of what's called the Vienna Circle because they were in Vienna. And they invented, or not invented, but developed an approach which they called logical positivism. And this took the notion of certainty, of positive knowledge, to an extreme. They started to kind of eh, get up their own butts a little bit insofar as they, they thought they could get at um, saying with certainty what is a meaningful statement according to, you know, authentic knowledge and what isn't. And while they weren't that successful in sort of getting rid of all of the influence of Hegel <laughs> in philosophy, which that was someone that sort of um, irked them in the way that language was used in very imprecise ways, they did make massive contributions to getting people thinking about how do we know what we know, how do we, like, well, what we're getting on, um, what we get to uh, pauper and falsification, what is a scientific argument, what are the criteria, what is not scientific, what is metaphysical, when is an argument scientific. These questions were debated and I think most people today, as I will go on to say that, even people who ascribe to a positivist approach, which when I take a quantitative method methodological approach to the world, I do. I don't go quite this far to say that only scientific knowledge is authentic knowledge and that knowledge can only come through the use of, this, of a strict scientific method when applied to human beings. But one of the things in terms of differentiating between quantitative and qualitative research, which I'll talk about in a future lecture, is this demarcation principle of falsification. What distinguishes a scientific claim from a non-scientific claim? Or how do we distinguish the scientific from the pseudoscientific? A positivist, like in prime, this pauper who came up with this, argued that scientific statements could be phrased in such a way that they could be shown to be wrong, and this could be tested. The way that this is practiced in the sciences is the idea of the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis begins by saying, my theory is wrong. <laughs> it does. It assumes no effect. Let's say, using the example of people more likely to turn out to vote as they get older. If I want to test the claim that the older you are, the more likely you are to vote, according to Popper, and according to the way we've been doing science since Popper, the best way to find out whether or not that that theory or the, is, is an accurate description of what is happening in the world is to derive a hypothesis from that theory of what the world would look like. And then assume the opposite. Assume no effect. Assume your theory is not at all working in the world. So what I would do is my null hypothesis would be stated as um, age is unrelated to voter turnout. 
that knowing about how old you are, knowing what your years in age are, then I should know nothing more about your likelihood to vote. Knowing that you're 17 or 70 will not allow me to predict with any more certainty whether you turned out. Of course, if you're 17, you probably couldn't vote unless it was in the Scottish referendum. But okay, let's say 18 to 80. Um, I can't use that information if my theory is wrong to predict the likelihood of your turnout. If I go and run a regression model and the age variable is statistically significant in that, you know, either the, the younger you are, let's say I was predicting that the older you are to vote, if the coefficient is statistically significant, first I'm showing that there is an effect. And then the next thing is if it's the case that it's positive, in other words, the older you are, the more likely you are to vote, those two things go up at the same rate. Well, now I have two pieces of information. One, I can reject the null hypothesis of no effect, and I can reject um, the any null hypothesis that it would be more associated with younger people rather than older people. These coefficients then allow us to reject the null hypothesis of no effect, and if we reject the null hypothesis of no effect, we then must conclude there is an effect because there is no other option. And this is the key to falsification. By overcoming a null hypothesis, you have to um, reject it, and therefore you must conclude that your alternative is correct, that there is an effect going on in the world. This is why the theory of evolution can never be proven true. It can only withstand tests over and over again of falsification. And that's what, what we do in science. We don't prove things are true. We show that they're not not true. <laughs> it's impossible that this is not true because the evidence allows me to reject the null hypothesis. Modern social scientists really don't take such an extreme view about scientific knowledge being the only authentic knowledge, but generally positives, positivist would assert that in social science this is what an empirical theory is. An empirical theory attempts to describe and or explain social phenomenon or phenomena using an interconnected abstract set of statements that consist of assumptions, definitions, and empirically testable statement that an explanation is a causal account of social phenomenon or phenomena. This operates from a foundationless ontology that social phenomenon exist and can be measured and used to predict and or explain outcomes. In other words, this approach assumes that the social world behaves in a similar fashion to the natural world, therefore the ideas and practices and principles that are valid in the physical sciences are also valid when using them to investigate the social world. In contrast with this focus on natural phenomenon, a way to think about social phenomenon is that they are instead fixed effects, like in the quants perspective, that they are mutable and they contain varied perspectives. If we think about the concept of democracy, it was that idea was associated with mob rule until, you know, the near the end of the 17th century, when people actually established democracies for the first time in, in a very long time. And now they were so successful, democracy is seen as the most desirable form of government in many countries. So there were important thinkers along also, you know, sort of the 19th century, 18th century, who pointed out that the world is fundamentally disordered. And it is we, as the observers, who impose intelligibility upon it. This is taking a, a different perspective of this sort of the world exists independently and we can know it perfectly just by observing it using the scientific method. It's saying that the world itself, is, and I want to point out here, the social world is really um, organized by the ways in which we perceive it and people have historically organized themselves in a culture and a society and how we currently perceive our organization and the way that our societies um, are built. I want to go into a very oversimplified view of Kant to build on this. Um, and there's a, a lot more that if you find this interesting, you can go and read on it. Uh, I just didn't have time 
in within this lecture to go into Kant very deeply. But what I do want to highlight is that he accepted this notion that the human mind absorbs information through the sensory perceptions, but he disagreed with the idea of humans as mere empty vessels. He thought that our senses bring information to the mind and then the mind itself organizes the perceptions. Kant therefore concluded that the mind is an agent in its own right and our minds play a vital role in interpreting the external world. Now here Kant isn't distinguishing between the natural world and the social world as I did in the first part of the essay. He's just thinking, think about this as a more fundamental level. He's showing that order is not anchored in nature, but is anchored in universal and necessary concepts of the human mind. One of those is time, the way that we experience time. Another is the way that we experience um, space. There is something about our physical bodies and the way that our brains have evolved over time that give us a predisposition of uh, organizing what we perceive about the physical world in certain ways. Therefore, Kant distinguishes between the real world as it exists separate from mind, and that's the noumena, and then our perceptions of that physical world based on the constraints of our physical bodies and our mind, the phenomenal. That is our perception, our phenomenal perception is how we experience the world, but that doesn't necessarily give us an ability to make truth claims about how the world exists independent of our experiences of it. So this implication is that we can never say anything about how the noumenal world in itself exists. Rather, we can observe our own perceptions of the world and how it appears to us. And that is how we basically create knowledge. It's a step that we don't always talk about, but when we do tests and we see repeated experiments, um, turning out the same thing, we're using our phenomenal experience to make deductions about how the noumenal world works, but we, but what we're doing is ex we're testing our experiences to make sure that it's accurate against other people's, but that doesn't get us from our phenomenal experience over into the noumenal. More are ways that people have questioned the naturalist approaches over time. William Wheel critiqued the naturalist approach by pointing out that naturalists do not begin with a particular observation and then infer general theories. They begin with questions and imagine many possible answers. So our sensory perceptions are really only half the story and the rest of it depends on the appropriate processing of our perceptions. Naturalists are sure of a real world out there but they have few, if any, metaphysical arguments to show that their, uh, uh, their certainty about what the, that real world is, is actually the case. Because again, we're all limited to the kind of knowledge that we can produce based on the physical constraints of our own minds and bodies. Collingwood argued that facts are not discovered, but are man-made. And this is kind of getting back to this idea that facts are social constructions. Yes, there are some people who, you know, go out there and discover electricity, but the understanding, the preliminary understanding of what electricity was, whether it was a stream or, you know, how it operated, these were things that people just kind of made up and refined over time. And as our information got better, we had new concepts, new words, we had new ways of thinking about things, and all of that contributed to forming what we now have uh, as facts about electricity. Collingwood also noted that to observe anything requires observing it in relation to other things. Thus, we must first have some idea of what we are supposed to see. And different presuppositions in what we are supposed to see can give rise to different frames of reference for understanding what is happening in the world. Interpretivism is the epistemological perspective which follows from an anti-foundationalist perspective. According to Bryman, social phenomenon and their meanings are continually being accomplished by social actors. Therefore, someone taking a constructivism approach is presenting a specific version of social reality and trying to understand how others react and understand social phenomena. 
Interpretivism in social science is most often associated with the use of qualitative methodology and qualitative methods. Let's consider an example. If we wanted to study a sweatshop factory from a free market capitalist point of view, what kind of language would we use to describe the system of sweatshop factories feeding into a larger capitalist globalization process? What values, if we were coming at it from the position of free market capitalism, would underpin that research? What outcomes would be of most interest to you? Now consider the study of the same sweatshop factory, but from a Marxist point of view. What kind of language would a Marxist use to describe the exact same observations? What values about power relations would underpin the research or other values? And in terms of the outcomes, what would the outcomes of interest be to a Marxist compared to a free market capitalist? You can see here how it's not just about observing the sweatshop and how it fits into a larger global capitalist system, but the perspective that a researcher will bring to that question will inform the language, the values, and the things that they're going to be focused on in terms of what is of interest. There's also the role of meaning. Dilthi discussed the role of meaning, that would be notions of purpose, value, ideals, these sorts of things, when distinguishing the natural and the social world. Althwaite wrote that human actions are not given in the same way as natural phenomenon, that social scientists begin with data that has already been interpreted in everyday language. So social scientists should deepen and systematize and qualify already existing understandings. People shouldn't just take um, you know, the, the research that had been done by straight white males about women being less interested in politics back in the 50s at face value when what they were writing and has been documented is not something they found empirically, but something that they just kind of decided that's common knowledge. So we'll just work that in there. You have to re-examine the assumptions of previous generations. You have to understand that every writer comes with his or her own perspective. So this is being, being sensitized to these things. Don't, it doesn't make you, you know, like, oh, the use of nuance and problematic. It, it's actually a more precise way of thinking about very subtle social phenomenon. In terms of how knowledge is socially produced, I spend a little time just pointing to Kuhn and the Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It's a very good book, I, I recommend it, but one of the conclusions from the Structure of Scientific Revolutions is that, is that scientists aren't always so open-minded as, as one would think. That a community of scientists becomes committed to established truths, which they seek to defend, sort of as the Catholic Church did against Galileo when he started to attack the idea of the earth being the center of the universe. And in defending that paradigm, they reject arguments of critics. So you have a sort of in a, a, a hegemonic scientific discourse, let's say. Um, a good example of this is when quantum theory began to emerge out of atomic theory. Revolution occurs when the dominant paradigm breaks down because the results that are being produced are continuously inconvenient to the established tr um, truth that the, com that the community is committed to. Those of you who are quite geeky might know that Einstein, for instance, did not like the idea of quantum theory. He was more on the atomic side of determinism, and this idea of an you know, these, uh, quantum phenomenon made him very uneasy. Um, just because Einstein was a very smart man doesn't mean that he had instant mental flexibility to be empirically led. This is something that you need to do a self-check on always as a social scientist and look for the newest data and examine it so your views always reflect the current state of understanding rather than what you are attached to. There's also the um, idea that we will put out that um, facts, arguments, and ideas do not always originate with individuals. Instead, they are sustained and maintained by social relationships. What you're learning right now is, uh, about social science 
isn't coming because you're doing independent research into social science. You're learning it by listening to somebody else who's studied it. You know, we learn most of our knowledge from other people, not through our direct experiences. We learn it through books or boring lectures like this one or on YouTube. Knowledge, therefore, is obtained by consulting a pool of available knowledge that has been produced, maintained, and carried by members of the society around us. This is how knowledge is socially constructed and distributed and understood and also changes over time. Hey, that's the end of the slide. Awesome. That is going to be it for now. The next thing I am going to be discussing is more of the quantitative approach. So I've, I've ended this lecture talking about the ways in which um, language is important to the study of the social because it frames our understanding. Self-awareness of the values and the worldviews that we bring to data when we go to interpret it is important that we get knowledge from other people. It's not like all knowledge is derived independently because we all spend our time testing everything we read in a science book or everything we read in a social science book. So this gets back to the production of knowledge that we have available to us, information on the strengths and weaknesses of the ways that researchers in the sciences produce knowledge, how far it can go, and what its limitations are. And when you know that, then you I at least feel a lot more confident reading a piece of research, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, and seeing it as a data point rather than a truth claim or the definitive result for all time. It's one piece of information, and I also try to keep an open mind in, in case someone else comes up with a critique of that claim and saying, ah, well, look at all the information they left out. Or if they would have thought about it from this pers perspective, they would have seen this phenomenon at work. So knowledge and facts are socially constructed. That's just true. <laughs> it's going to upset some people, but it doesn't change the fact that that's what it is. Right, guys, I will prepare the next lecture and put it out in the next few days. Thanks for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video and getting your geek on with me. I've been Christy, and you're always awesome. I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.